Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Um, so thank you very much, Surani, for the introduction. And it, it's really a delight, actually, to be presenting here in person again after many years during the pandemic. And I still get a little bit of a buzz um, in doing these kinds of um, sessions in real life. Um, so in this presentation, I'm just going to be talking through a little bit of what we know about the impact of the pandemic on um, childhood vaccine uptake and confidence and taking us through some of the data that we do or perhaps do not have to um, explore this area. So firstly, just to um, provide an overview of some of the trends that we saw on um, childhood vaccine uptake. And, and firstly, looking at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and global DTP uh, coverage. And, and here's the trend um, over the last uh, 20 years or so, um, looking at just the, the top lines here, um, tracking across. And we have seen actually, um, since about 2010, a plateauing in uptake of childhood vaccines, um, particularly measured by this um, main indicator of a DTP uptake. We saw a little bit of a dip um, during the COVID years and, and that is um, heading back upwards to, to where we were roughly pre-pandemic levels. Um, so th there's still more to um, gain here. And of course, noting that um, this is a global picture, so it really hides a lot of regional and country specific differences. Um, just to take a closer look at some of the differences between regions, um, firstly, looking at DTP3 coverage with the regional comparison, um, we see the African region um, at, at the lowest levels here, and then also um, looking at their recovery. Um, un unfortunately, we've seen that it's, it's the African region that has not recovered any gains at all, really, um, since the, the 2019 levels. So th there are many explanations for this, also considering some of the demographic changes um, in the African region, but most of the attention really here is still needed in the African region to um, rebuild and recover those losses during the pandemic. Um, also taking a closer look at um, low-income countries and then particularly moving from looking at um, DTP1 coverage across to um, measles-containing vaccines. And, and here we can see that it's really these low-income countries um, that have shown the lowest um, limited signs of recovery. Um, and also looking across to the measles-containing vaccines, it's clear these low-income countries that have made the least progress in any recovery, but also still lagging far behind um, middle or higher-income countries as well. And, and here at the bottom, we see just the, the numbers of kids that received um, that are zero dose, um, which is defined as having um, not received the DCP1 vaccine. Um, so a lot of work still to be done in recovering um, those drops that were incurred during the pandemic. And we're seeing these consequences now with large or disruptive measles outbreaks happening all around the world. So in 40, more than 40 countries, there have been these measles outbreaks just in the last year, which is highly concerning um, and, and directing a lot of resources towards these outbreak response campaigns, which are really very reactive and rarely contribute to building systems and strengthening services. So there's a lot of resources going towards these countries in mainly in the African continent and um, Southeast Asia to be able to respond to these outbreaks. Um, and at the same time, we're also seeing these diphtheria outbreaks in many countries around the world, um, primarily in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, where there's been 80% of cases in a, an enormous outbreak in um, that country, but also now spreading to neighbouring countries in the West African region, but also in, in other countries. So this really um, illustrates the 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 consequences of these drops in coverage um, that we've seen in recent years. So what are we doing to respond to um, these declines in coverage during the pandemic? Um, we have um, worked with partners through the mechanism of the Global Immunization Agenda 2030. Um, we've been working on an initiative called the Big Catch-Up, which is really intended to intensify immunization strengthening activities and uh, campaign style activities to reach those children that were missed with critical doses during the pandemic. And, and this is really a cross partner initiative um, working across three main areas. Firstly, um, catching up those children that were missed, not only the zero dose children, but children that missed 
any other doses in that first year of life, most importantly, um, restoring programs. So this is considering all sorts of other aspects of immunization program delivery. So services, stock, health workforce, et cetera. So ensuring that health systems and services are again well functioning to um, achieve high coverage of childhood vaccination. And then lastly, strengthening the program. So this is really then thinking about those opportunities to um, improve the quality of service delivery so that it contributes to improving primary care as well. And thinking about program resilience and the, the strength within programs to be able to be more resistant, should we say, to negative impacts, whether it is a pandemic or other types of negative um, events that can um, lead to a decline in confidence and coverage. So here's the range of activities that global partners have been um, in, intensively supporting for programs to be able to close these coverage gaps. And on the right-hand side here, here's the, the plan which outlines um, how to do this in more detail. Um, SAGE is WHO's strategic advisory group of experts on immunization, and it met most, most, it met most recently about a month ago and one of the key agenda items was to look at um, progress on implementation of various activities to close these gaps and to recover these gains. Um, and SAGE endorsed an action agenda associated with IA 2030 um, to propose a series of short-term and longer-term priority actions to um, strengthen immunization programs. So not only catch up and strengthening but also thinking about inequity and promoting inequity and understanding the causes of inequities um, in health that also lead to um, low coverage. Um, efforts to regain control of these measles outbreaks and to also address the coverage gaps that do lead to the outbreaks, um, making the case for investment. So there's a lot of advocacy work needed to um, ensure that decision makers and political leaders are making the necessary investments in services and systems with these linkages to primary care, um, accelerating new vaccine introductions. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of focus on HPV introduction, um, where those have not already been implemented, but now also looking towards next year, malaria vaccine introduction as well. So looking at closing these gaps um, where countries have not yet introduced these vaccines. And then lastly, thinking about life course vaccination as well and taking advantage of all the investments throughout the pandemic to think about immunization, not only as a program for childhood immunization, but also for adolescents with HPV vaccination primarily, but also across the life course, thinking about um, COVID and influenza vaccination as well. So the other question is, did the pandemic cause more hesitancy? I've shown you a, a lot of charts here and trends which have shown a dip in coverage of childhood vaccination during the pandemic, what are the causes of those drops, okay? And what data do we have? Because there has been a lot of discussion about hesitancy and misinformation, but where do we actually have substantial data to explain the causes of these declines and even any of the interrelated linkages to what's been happening with COVID vaccine and the pandemic in general. So over the last uh, two to three years with WHO and colleagues and partners around the world, um, we've been looking at exactly answering this question. So what have been the factors that could have contributed to lower coverage of childhood vaccination? And one of the first main considerations, of course, is a decline in confidence. And so what are the ways in which there could have been a spillover from the negative side effects and negative attitudes um, and beliefs towards vac uh, COVID vaccination? And how did that spill over towards related perceptions for a childhood vaccination? Um, was there also a, a decline, a, a, a less belief in the importance and benefits of vaccination as well? Um, also, at the same time, we have seen some movement towards polarities to these extremes of refusal or those who are really advocates for vaccination. So this movable middle that we've often referred to as the those who 
um, be, on, be on the fence when in their attitudes towards um, or intentions towards a vaccination. We are seeing more movement towards these extremes. Um, other changes that we've seen are related to people's own experiences of getting vaccinated for, for COVID. So those um, individual experiences, for example, of side effects or of having to wait for hours to get a COVID vaccine or having to invest a lot in that journey just to get access to a COVID vaccine. Um, there's been some spillover there as well. So um, there's been some reactants from mandates. We, we've seen that um, there was a lot of um, negative reaction to um, mandates and ways in which many governments made it compulsory for people to be vaccinated to um, access um, other um, social spaces in, in society. Um, and there's also been um, measures of declining trust in, in health systems and government. So this is kind of some of the contributions when we look at confidence and, and people's experiences, but equally there can be many access related factors that explain this decline in coverage. And these relate to um, concerns about exposure to COVID-19 vaccines. So perhaps people were not going out to vaccinate their children because they were concerned about potentially getting COVID on their way to the health facility or waiting at the health facility um, to get vaccination for, for their child. Um, perhaps there have been greater out-of-pocket costs associated with getting childhood vaccination as well. People have also had many other competing life priorities during the pandemic of just the day-to-day -day life, the day-to-day -day jobs um, being a greater priority than thinking about when and how to get their child vaccinated. Um, and there's been all sorts of health system disruptions as well. Services that have been no longer functioning um, a health workforce that has been moved in other um, to be directed towards other areas of health, to be responding to the pandemic. There's also been a lot of um, vaccine stockouts for childhood vaccination as well. So this presents a picture of, of data that we gathered with partners and colleagues throughout the pandemic to understand these causes, which shows the mix of interrelated factors. But importantly, unless the systems and services and vaccines themselves are accessible and available and affordable. That is the main starting point for any kind of um, uptake of vaccines. So what other data might exist? So earlier this year, in um, April this year, there was a publication from UNICEF um, for every child vaccination that presented data um, on the proportion of a population that perceives vaccines as important and the change comparing before and after the pandemic. So um, this a colored line here down the middle, that's the proportion of a population that perceives vaccines as important. And then this um, is the uh, in gray here, indicating that that's the per uh, percentage point change um, comparing before and after the pandemic. This is data from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the Vaccine Confidence Project um, that measure these perceptions around importance of vaccination. And overall, we've seen a clear decline in perceived importance of vaccination comparing before and after the pandemic. So this is really important data to note. It's consistently found globally in many ways, um, but we also have to remember that confidence is only one driver that contributes to uptake. So as we've seen from already the presentations so far this morning, we need to take into account not only people's um, confidence or their attitudes, but also other considerations such as these social norms and social influences from community leaders, plus also the access related factors as well. Um, I want to make a comment about mandates because this has been studied a lot in the recent years and um, mandates were applied in almost all countries as a, a strategy to, in a way, force people to get vaccinated, to make it a requirement of going to work or accessing a, a public space in many ways. Um, we saw this perhaps resulted in a small gain in coverage in, in many settings, but what were some of the other um, consequences of the application of these mandates? So I just want to point to two publications 
um, many esteemed colleagues on these publications, but highlighting a couple of common findings of these various um, studies, which essentially highlight the damaging effects on public trust, vaccine confidence, political polarization, human rights and inequities, et cetera, or results emphasizing these negative effects of mandates on a country's program. So there, there's a lot to be said by many other experts, in fact, on this topic, but I do want to highlight what this means for trust in particular. Um, and we've spoken a lot about trust already this morning and, and heard a little bit about who are the most trusted people in society and who we need to look towards for a recommendation towards vaccination. But I think in, in future, this does signal that we should be applying mandates with caution and on a selective basis um, and perhaps as a last resort, if at all. So thinking more about trust, I wanted to pull out this interesting publication that um, also carried out an analysis of the conditions associated with um, COVID infection rates. And this is an intention to um, explore these contextual factors that are associated with pandemic preparedness. Now, essentially what this study found is that, well, firstly, they looked at these contextual factors associated with pandemic preparedness. They looked at pandemic preparedness indices, which um, measure a variety of um, actions that, and um, plans and aspects of plans that are in place to prepare for a pandemic. So there are those um, pandemic prepared in preparedness indices, um, healthcare capacity indices, how well is the health system set up to respond to a pandemic? They looked at governance factors and they also looked at these social indicators. And what they found actually is that the only area where there was an association with these um, infection rates and actually higher coverage rates of vaccination was trust in government and trust in, in interpersonal um, factors, interpersonal trust. These were the only areas that they found that had an association with lower infection rates and higher vaccine coverage. Um, so this is really important in giving us directions towards thinking about pandemic preparedness and even outbreak response. And importantly, we know that if there is a lot of trust in government and interpersonal trust and this social capital in society, we know that that um, means that people will be more compliant often with the recommendations of public health um, practices and actions to be carried out when um, there are recommendations, recommendations towards vaccination or other types of interventions such as wearing masks or social distancing, for example. So um, an important kind of direction here where we need to, to place focus in future. So during the pandemic, there were so many other things happening in the world. So I just want to touch on some of the other implications from the COVID pandemic um, for immunisation in, in general. So we saw a huge amount of attention of and global cooperation and funding for research, for vaccine development and delivery. So this was really a, an important, promising progress in the ways in which global partners work together. Um, we also saw a, a huge acceleration in vaccine development. Perhaps there are pros and cons here. We were able to um, ensure that there were vaccines available in record short timelines, but at the same time, people, there were rumors and questions about the safety of those vaccines that had been developed um, and approved in, in such short time frames as well. Um, we saw new vaccine technologies being used and accepted in, in such an incredible time frame, um, particularly the mRNA vaccine. So just so many important advancements in these new technologies, but again, flip sides for misinformation, rumours, concerns, etc. Um, we saw a lot of rapid policy and regulatory adaptations for, for countries to be introducing these vaccines under emergency use listings, um, to be able to set up the monitoring safety surveillance systems, etc. We saw a huge amount of public awareness and attention on the importance of vaccines, um, the role of digital platforms in um, being able to schedule appointments and um, do all sorts of monitoring, listening, tracking for AEFIs and all that, all other aspects of um, vaccine delivery and uh, coverage. 
Um, but also at the same time, there was a lot of inequitable access and a lot of disparities and delays in vaccines reaching low-income countries. And, and we, we've heard already a little bit this morning about the consequences of those delays um, and really what that meant for giving space for some of these um, questions and concerns to arise. Um, so th these are some of the other broader implications from the pandemic on what it means for immunisation programs in future. But going forward, for us to actually have a better data, um, better data available to really understand the relative contribution of not only confidence and, and people's attitudes, but we also need to be understanding these social processes and social influences, people's motivations and intentions towards vaccination, and also practical issues. And these are the important access-related factors, the availability and affordability of vaccination, um, the ease of access, the quality of service, that experience on site of getting vaccinated, and the ways in which people are treated by a health worker. Um, and, and even just afterwards, um, you know, the experience of that, that adverse event. So WHO, with um, experts and partners, um, we have um, carried out a huge body of work that led to the development of this framework um, of the behavioural and social drivers of vaccination. And there are associated tools here, survey instruments and in-depth interview guides available for childhood vaccination and for COVID vaccination. Um, we also have work in progress right now on HPV vaccination for development of similar corresponding tools for HPV and influenza vaccination, in fact. And so these tools give us an opportunity um, uh, to have comparable standardised data available on all of these various drivers that contribute to vaccination uptake. And unless we're gathering data using these globally validated standardised tools based on this framework, we'll actually not have the understanding either locally or globally of what contributes to high or low vaccine uptake and therefore our ability to address those various um, barriers with tailored and targeted interventions. So in addition to not only investing in data collection that's necessary to diagnose and understand these causes of uptake, um, we also need to be implementing evidence-based interventions to increase uptake. So in 2021, with our um, group of experts and, and colleagues, um, we carried out a scoping review to identify promising effective interventions that correspond to each of these different domains in our framework that are shown to increase vaccine uptake. And this is really important because after programs can be gathering this data, they can then use this kind of um, tool or table, it's quite simple, to be able to identify corresponding interventions that will act on those various barriers and drivers that are identified. And generally, we can see that are, there are some um, interventions that are useful to inform and educate um, dialogue-based interventions, one-on-one -on -one conversations be being particularly um, useful. There are um, uh, interventions that act at more community and societal level, that act on social influences and social norms. And then there are also these practical issues um, it, corresponding interventions that um, help move people from intention to action and really um, act more on the behavioural aspect of vaccination and really ultimately helping to make vaccination as easy and convenient as possible. So there's a range of interventions here considering reduction of out-of-pocket costs, improving service quality, um, reminders, making vaccination the, the default, um, certain kinds of incentives. And of course, um, as we've even seen already this morning, there's a mix of these interventions that are often needed. It's not a, a one size fits all, or not a so-called single bullet or single strategy that will be effective. We need to be considering a range of these different um, interventions and how they work together and continually doing some base level um, monitoring of these um, of the implementation of these strategies so we have a better understanding locally of, of what works. And um, building on the work that we carried out a couple of years ago, 
Um, there's been further evidence um, published recently also on effective strategies. Um, similar findings here, um, this is, uh, authors um, include an esteemed colleague in the room here, but essentially showing that behavioral interventions um, can be used to increase uptake, but particularly highlighting the promising provider recommendation for, and on-site vaccination. And with on-site vaccination, noting that it's really important to ensure that the timing and location of the, those services are established and determined together with participation from local community leaders. So the delivery and design of those services meet the needs of those local community members. Um, I think that uh, there, there's a, a, a link here to the publication and also the I Vaccinate booklet that's um, available, which um, makes this um, in, in a, available in a more actionable format. So it's great to see the accumulating evidence showing the kinds of interventions that are effective to increase uptake. So, so how should we be thinking about um, addressing low coverage um, with equity? So firstly, really thinking about prioritising populations who experience inequity, those who are um, often left behind, who are um, marginalised, who experience um, a socio low socioeconomic um, status, or low, low levels of education, um, low literacy, identifying those populations who are often zero dose, um, who are who lowest coverage and um, working towards increasing uptake for these populations as a priority. Um, then we need to be understanding what are the barriers and drivers to vaccination for these specific populations thinking not only about confidence and um, motivations and intention, but the full scope of these drivers of vaccination, um, applying evidence for what works. So really considering the evidence base on these effective strategies, but importantly, working together with communities and civil society and thinking about the role of information um, and also addressing system weaknesses, um, working with our health workforce and supporting our frontline workers to be those trusted champions and advocates, sharing accurate information as part of all these activities as well. And really thinking about these connections to primary care um, so that we're able to strengthen these, the bundling of services that not only includes vaccination, but all sorts of other um, maternal and child health interventions as well. So um, just a quick slide on where to go for more information on our tools and guidance. Um, developed with many partners and experts in this area. Um, so we have a WHO position paper on the behavioural and social drivers and the guide with the globally uh, standardised tools, the survey, the interview guides. Um, these can be locally adapted to different um, local languages and local contexts, um, plus other types of tools um, to um, help programs implementing quality services and working with communities as well to design those locally tailored um, interventions. Um, so that's all from me. I'm happy to take any questions as well. Thank you very much.